All right. Thank you, Candice. So we're going to be talking about how WASM simplifies streaming data pipelines. First, a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Tyler Rockwood. Uh, as Candace said, I'm a senior software engineer at Red Panda. Uh, I love all things distributed systems, databases, and programming languages. I'm the current technical lead for uh, WebAssembly powered data transformations at Red Panda. There's a, a few of my socials will be at the bottom. Uh, they'll be posted in the chat and then also at the end of, they'll be posted again at the end. Uh, if you want to get a hold of me for any reason, uh, I'm happy to talk all things Red Panda and WebAssembly. So we'll briefly go over our agenda. We're going to start out by just giving you an overview of what is WebAssembly, um, how a little bit of details of the VM, how it works, um, and how you can interact with it. Why would you want to use WebAssembly for stream processing? Uh, and then we'll talk about the integration challenges of putting a WebAssembly runtime into Red Panda itself, and then talk about how we overcame some of those challenges and some of the cool uh, technical things that we got to do. Um, and then we'll end with some Q&A. First, we're going to start with just what is WebAssembly? Maybe you've heard of it, maybe you haven't. Um, we'd like to start with just a little poll to kind of gauge your ex level of experience with WebAssembly. Um, yeah, maybe you've never heard of WebAssembly and you're here to kind of find out some more. Maybe you have heard of it, know it's some cool, uh, interesting technology, but um, yeah, haven't interacted with it. Or maybe you're somebody who uses this all the time in production. We'd love to hear um, yeah, what your level of experience is uh, in the poll. Cool, it looks like uh, answers are coming in. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, get, get moving forward here. Thanks for your responses. Uh, so jumping into what is WebAssembly? So WebAssembly, also known as WASM, is a binary instruction format for a stack-based virtual machine. So um, if you're, maybe you're familiar with virtual machines or not, but it, it's designed to have, to be a virtual machine that's a compilation target for many different languages. So you can take all of your, favorite languages such as Go or Kotlin or Rust and compile them down to WebAssembly. And then you can run them really anywhere. Initially, it was built for the web and for the browser. But um, today, as you'll see, they're being used in message brokers and server applications as um, function as a service platforms. It's really, really taking off and being used all over. Um, so the main things that make WebAssembly appealing to use in these situations are that it's efficient, it's uh, very has very good compatibility guarantees and it's safe. Um, we'll talk, we'll touch more on all of these and you'll get a better idea of them as we progress through. Um, but efficient in terms of the bytecode itself for the VM often directs uh, maps directly to common hardware instructions. Um, so for things that are doing compilation of WebAssembly into native code for speed up, which we'll talk more about, um, it, it can be a fairly easy mapping. Um, it's also open and, and backwards compatible and versionless, and there's new standards that sort of can be incrementally added into WebAssembly, um, which is which is key for, you know, if these things are running in browsers for a long time or in hosted services. And then uh, safety is also a key pillar of WebAssembly. So it happens in a, in a sandbox ex execution environment. You can, you have lots of controls over almost every aspect of memory and CPU limits that you can do. And we'll talk a, a, additionally about a, a standard that gives you the WebAssembly the ability to access uh, OS level primitives. Cool. So we'll talk about the main major pieces of a WebAssembly uh, VM. So the main one is probably the module, the, the compiled module, which is this blue box here and is the compiled version of that binary instruction format uh, loaded into a, a VM. So that represents things like what functions are available and all the instructions required to execute those functions. Uh, and then specification for how much memory it needs and um, something called a table, which eventually effectively gives you the ability to do like pointers to functions so that that's defined in a sort of portable format. And then to once you have that, that compiled format, you also need to take the uh, actual some, some host memory, give it to the VM so that the WebAssembly um, guest code can interact with it. And then also you need an instance table to store all of those different uh, function pointers and things like that. And when you take those three things and combine it together, you can get an actual live running instance of a WebAssembly VM. So next we're gonna dive a little bit more into functions and uh, the execution of functions. 
So earlier I mentioned that WebAssembly VMs are, a, or WebAssembly is a, is a stack-based uh, model for the VM. So we're going to go through an ex example of just adding two numbers, just to sort of give you a sort of idea if you're not familiar with VMs or, or um, what a stack-based VM looks like, just sort of how the execution works and how these different instructions. So these are three actual instructions from WebAssembly. Um, and we're sort of just going to walk through the execution, sort of like you're stepping through it with a debugger um, one at a time. So this first in instruction is um, representing a constant for uh, a 32-bit integer. So um, there are four main types in WebAssembly. There's a 32-bit integer, a 64-bit integer, and then the same for floating point. There's a 32-bit floating point and the 64-bit um, floating point types. There's a there's a, another standard. Other standards have come along and added more types, such as SIMD um, for sort of vectorized um, instructions and also references to functions and things like that. But those those first four are the four four main core types. Um, so the first, this first instruction, this const instruction just pushes a constant value onto the stack. So we're pushing one onto the stack. And then the next instruction pushes two onto the stack. And now we have two items on our stack and we get to our add instruction. And basically um, all these instructions consume and produce uh, onto the stack. So these const instructions, all they did is push things onto the stack. They didn't pop things off, add, pops two things off the stack, adds the result of them and pushes them back onto the stack. So if you see, we pop one and two, add them together and we'll push three back on. So that's sort of the general mental model of the stack based uh, machine and how it works. So generally when a VM runs, it needs to convert this sort of stack based machine into actual um, hardware in instructions that are ran. So there's a, a variety of ways of doing this and they all have their own trade offs So I have sort of here a spectrum of uh, compilation time. So how long it takes to take the WebAssembly bytecode format and turn it into something that's executing on a CPU. Um, so on one end, you have really fast. Uh, so an interpreter is, has very little startup time needed. Um, but on the other hand, there's execution speed. So the more time you spend optimizing and uh, converting these the bytecode into actual machine code, you can get it, you can push performance faster and faster. So the sort of spectrum I'll talk about is there's an interpreter on one end, which just sort of like natively walk is a big loop that walks over every bytecode instruction and evaluates it um, sort of as we walked through in our example. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you have a compiler, something like the uh, Clang compiler, LLVM compiler suite can let you um, build something that would take all those bytecode instructions and actually turn them into um, hardware instructions directly and doing all the different optimization passes that a compiler framework like Clang can do. Um, and then sort of, and then in the middle is something uh, known as a just-in-time compiler. If you're familiar with JVMs or anything like that, it's a very popular, the most popular uh, JIT compiler. Basically you do the sort of compiler step, but you do it incrementally and on the fly. So instead of doing everything at once and doing a big optimization passes, you'll just do a single function. Um, and there's and there's sort of a spectrum even within just-in-time compilation where you do sort of what's known as a baseline or non-optimizing uh, compiler that will um, just basically directly map individual instructions to um, individual bytecode instructions to hardware instructions to sort of the goal being to uh, do compilation really fast. Whereas the other end of the spectrum, you have an optimizing JIT compiler that can do things like profile code as it's running to sort of figure out the right optimizations to apply and can do a lot more expensive and spend more time doing compilation for your hot code paths. Um, so that sort of gives you the spectrum. There are WebAssembly runtimes on this full spectrum and some individual runtimes implement multiple tiers of this. Um, so they have an interpreter that runs and then you can sort of upgrade functions to using the baseline JIT or even the optimizing JIT. And there are some uh, VMs that just use ahead of time compilation to really squeeze out all the performance um, that you can during runtime. Um, so this is sort of similar model to like, for example, the JVM I mentioned, uh, it actually is a, has a similar model. This is a initial code runs as an interpreter. Then there's the C1 and C2 compilers and C1 compiler sort of represents the baseline JIT and the C2 compiler is sort of the more optimizing um, JIT. And this is sort of a standard framework um, for that. So this, when you start to think about integrating WebAssembly into a live system, you got to kind of work through what's my use case, what are my trade-offs here that I want to take on this end of the spectrum and help you can pick. There's a variety of different runtimes out there can help you pick um, between them. Um, so that's good. That leads us into the next point, which is 
um, why I use Wasm to do lightweight stream processing. So um, you may not be familiar with stream processing. Um, so I just wanted to you know, throw up a poll and sort of gauge your, your level of uh, experience here. Have you heard of stream processing before? Are you somebody that does this all the time as your day job? Um, yeah, I would love to hear, get your thoughts and um, in the poll. And we'll give it a couple of seconds for everyone to put in your answers. Awesome. And we're sort of jump into talking about, about stream processing. So, um, so stream processing allows you to, um, as events get processed through like a message broker, such as Red Panda, um, you can sort of transfer, transform those on the fly. So one very common use case is sort of these stateless transformations. So we'll give an example here of, uh, there's a stream of JSON click events coming in from your website or whatever it is. Um, and you want to run a transformation because other parts of your uh, software stack use Avro instead of JSON, uh, which is Apache Avro is a, another common uh, format used in data streaming applications um, that has schemas and things like that. So you want to do this transformation for downstream consumers of this stream of events, these stream of clicks um, to consume them in Avro. So today what you do um, if you do this, you have these events coming into Red Panda, your message broker, and then what you do is you set up this whole other distributed system. Um, Apache Flink is a very common system for this, where you basically, uh, you'll you'll it, it's a great uh, framework for setting up these big streaming pipelines where you can read in the data from the broker, do your transformations, and you can write it back into the broker. Now, Flink can do a lot more than that for this, but for this simple use case, there's a lot of extra overhead of additional VMs to provision management. You got to learn the separate programming model of, of Flink and manage it in production and monitor it. Um, so sort of the idea with WebAssembly within Red, Pan within Red Panda is that we can just integrate these sort of stateless transformations directly into the message broker. So the broker itself, as it re receives these JSON events, can run your WebAssembly module to perform these different transformations and write it back out to a separate topic um, within the, the data streams for other these other consumers. So this eliminates a lot of overhead. Uh, we are not ping ponging data all over between these different distributed systems. There's less moving pieces to manage. Um, and it's just a lot simpler to get started and, and going when you go from just message broker to, okay, now I wanna do some stream processing and do some small transformations of, of my data. So that's sort of the, the, the main idea. Um, here and, and the benefits of using Wasm over some other sorts of programming language or plugin system is, um, I mean, some of the, the advantages that I talked about from the very beginning, you can really use any language. Um, a lot of languages, most languages um, can compile down to Wasm and, and I think it, that supports only growing. So uh, it frees users, you can meet your users where they're at and let them kind of program in their favorite language. And then also, um, especially in Red Panda, we you can strictly control the sort of runtime of, of the VM. So you can strictly impose limits on CPU usage, on memory usage, um, and things like that. And then also, we'll we're going to talk a little bit about the WASI standard, um, the WebAssembly system interface, uh, which basically gives a sandbox POSIX environment for people to give sort of, you can expose common uh, programming patterns to people um, so it doesn't feel like they're writing in some weird alien environment. Um, so yeah, these are a list of some of the languages that you can use. Um, some there's some languages that are even only compiled to WebAssembly. Grain and Assembly Script are examples of that. These are both languages that were built directly to write, compiled down to WebAssembly. Um, and then a lot of other popular languages can run in a WebAssembly VM as well. Awesome. So some of those uh, runtime limits, like I said, are very important for Red Panda, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that later in the presentation. But here's just some example of the CPU and memory limits that you can give. So for CPU, um, you can there's a concept known as gas metering, which basically lets you stop execution after some number of, of instruction counts. So for example, if somebody accidentally has some weird edge case that triggers an infinite loop, that's not just going to hog up CPU in our broker. We can say, okay, you can put some time limit on, say, every transformation can run for X amount of milliseconds. And if it runs longer, then abort it. Um, and and uh, there, there's other techniques as well for um, supporting... Uh, for like other threads aborting the runtime and things like that. Um, so lots of lots of different controls you can give. Also for for memory usage, you can put bounds on how big 
um, how much memory you can use this is important in, in Red Panda because we have a lot of strict uh, requirements on how much memory we have. You can put bounds on those table size and those are two big usages of memory. And then also a lot of the VMs themselves have pluggable allocators. So if you want to have different allocation techniques, um, this is common if you're in the, like C or C++, so you have different allocators that you want to use. Maybe you want to use a, a pre-reserved pool of memory for your VMs. Um, a lot of them support being able to plug in different allocators. Um, so we're going to switch gears and talk about WASI. I mentioned WASI is great. It's a it's a this system interface. So you, all these common things that you're used to interacting when you're writing code are things like accessing a clock, accessing environment variables, having access to random data, standard in and out in a file system or sockets or things like this. Um, these are all things that WebAssembly core doesn't have a concept of. Um, but again, there's a standard for sort of uh, this is important for upstream languages and tool chains to be able to compile down to some standard. Um, and then basically what happens is it's up to the host that's the VM is running in to implement all these methods. So um, you can do things like only grant access to part, parts of the file system or only certain file system commands you can do um, or disallow so socket traffic or things like that. Um, so there's a lot of nice things about having this sort of sandboxed uh, sort of like in, over the OS level primitives that you sort of take for granted, you can sort of have full control over within WebAssembly. Um, so as somebody who's embedding WebAssembly into your uh, software, how do you how do you interact with the VM? So basically you end up defining an application binary interface. So this specifies, um, essentially there's a, a, a set, some functions that both the uh, program that's running expects to be um, exposed. So the guest that runs within the VM can have specific methods that it knows it can call into, and it's going to expose certain me methods um, that it knows will be called. So for example, we can do this for every time there's a new record that comes through on, on our data stream, we can call a specific callback. Um, and there's a limited set of types that you can use for this, which is just basically the types that are available within WebAssembly. You can have, you know, integers and pointers. Um, and there's also a standard that lets you pass arbitrary host data. That's sort of like an opaque pointer, um, but not all runtimes have support for that quite yet. Um, so, but if you want to pass more complicated data, um, generally the, the pattern that you use here is uh, I32 values can be interpreted as pointers into way, uh, an offset within the module's memory. Um, so if you want to have like so, a more complicated struct or some binary encoding that you pass data through, like JSON or uh, whatever it may be, you can write that into the VM's memory and then pass a pointer to the start offset of that data um, in. And that's sort of the, the mechanism you can use to pass back and forth. So we're going to walk through a very specific example within the WASI spec of um, just reading some random random data. So that top signature is the the signature that the um, that says, if I, if I am going to run in a WASI environment, I expect there to be a function called random underscore get, um, that is exported that I can use. And if we translate that sort of, um, uh, that signature into what a C function would look like, you can see you will return some int 16. That's an error code of yes, no, if the getting reading from the random source works, and then there's a buffer and then how long that buffer is. Um, which in the WebAssembly land just are a couple of integers that get passed around. Um, but as as you see within to the guest, those are actually um, pointers into the its own memory and then how much into how long of a of a buffer within that memory um, you should write random data into. So hopefully that gives you a good idea of sort of what that interface between the two uh, guest and the host running uh, look like. So we're gonna talk a little bit about downsides. Uh, to WebAssembly, it's not a perfect thing. Um, it's it's getting better all the time, but there's still some downsides. One is um, there's some upstream tooling that's still maturing. Uh, a, a great example of this is is Golang. Um, tiny, there's a there's a, a separate compiler for Golang called TinyGo that um, compiles down to WebAssembly using LLVM uh, and um, that can use WASI, but upstream WASI, uh, upstream Go, uh, the main Go compiler can only compile it cannot compile to Go that runs in a in that WASI environment that I was just talking about. Um, although it's coming in the next release that I believe is maybe already out or coming this month. Um, and also things like interpreted languages. So if you want to run JavaScript or Python or Ruby inside of WASM, you need to package the whole interpreter for that language, which ends up getting like quite beefy just to run your interpreted languages. 
All right. Uh, and then, yeah, so feature support. Like I said, there's WebAssembly has been to, built to be modular and backwards compatible. So all these new features that have been added to it um, are, are sort of like added on to the side. And what support is there is uh, like constantly evolving uh, very rapidly even. For example, there's um, like GC for, and this is needed for languages like Kotlin and Java to be able to do uh, garbage collection very efficiently inside the VM. Um, it, it's right now only supported in V8 and I believe it's behind a flag, although maybe it's an origin trial now. Um, and then there's also a, a big change coming through um, called the component model. You can read about that, but there's um, it basically changed how you link in the interface between different uh, WebAssembly modules because you can have multiple of these that you uh, upload sort of like shared libraries and access and talk to each other. Um, and then the current WASI support is based on a preview snapshot from 2020. Um, so that has changed a lot and made a few different iterations. Um, and yeah, it's, it's continually evolving. Um, so yeah, if maybe those downsides don't work for you or, you know, what are the other alternatives? So there are some languages that have better support for uh, like plugin experience. You know, one that comes to mind for me is uh, I've worked in a lot in JVM systems is Java has support for sort of loading jars dynamically. Um, and other interpreted languages can usually dynamically load code as well. Um, so that can be a good option for some people, although usually with those options, there's like little to no sandboxing. So essentially when you load that jar, it can do sort of anything you want. So as long as it's highly trusted in highly trusted environments, um, you can also kind of push performance a little better because you get all the same performance. Um, there's no like extra VM wrapper in there, excuse me, within the JVM. So, and that can be an alternative. And then there's also some more specific or niche uh, solutions such as uh, Google's common expression language. So I used to work at Google and on the common expression language itself. And um, it's a great language for things like writing policy or very small snippets. It's specifically built not to be Turing complete and execute very fast. Um, so if you have certain use cases that don't need the full overhead of Wasm, although Wasm, is, uh, Wasm VMs are very lightweight um, generally compared to like something embedding a full JVM into a system. Uh, you, you may even want something more on the lightweight uh, version of the spectrum, um, which something like cell is a, is a great use, use case for that. Um, cool. So we're going to switch gears here and talk about the challenges about integrating a WebAssembly VM into Red Panda. Um, sort of we've been yeah talking about generally what is WebAssembly and sort of how to integrate it into a system. And I'll get into sort of the, the background and, and lessons we've learned from, from Red Panda. Before we jump into that, I want to talk about Red Panda. And before we do that... I want to just briefly uh, ask a poll of how familiar are you with Red Panda? Have you heard of it at all? Uh, is this the first time you've maybe heard about Red Panda? Are you um, using it in development or are you running a production cluster of Red Panda? I'd love to um, get your answers in the poll and um, yeah, we'll wait for those answers to kind of come through. Wonderful. And I see there are a few QA uh, questions. I will I will answer those towards, towards the end. Uh, keep, keep those coming in. Great. All right. I think I think we're good. We'll move on. So now I want to introduce, yeah, for you, those of you who are not familiar with Red Panda, just sort of in 60 seconds, give you a sort of idea of what Red Panda is. And then we'll talk about sort of the interesting constraints that it has as a system as somebody building and hacking on Red Panda itself. So Red Panda is a high performance streaming data engine. Um, if you're familiar with Apache Kafka, we are compatible with their API. Um, so you can produce and consume uh, records uh, but, but we, we, we are a more efficient and faster and lower cost of ownership version. Um, so we'll, we'll talk through some of sort of the key tenants that make Red Panda very fast and efficient. Um, but if you're unfamiliar with Kafka and sort of the paradigms there, um, Kafka basically breaks out into there are partitions that you read and write records to. And each of these partitions are, are logs, essentially. And there can be several thousands of these per cluster. And each log or partition is a raft group itself. So we run raft, usually three members is sort of the, the de facto number there um, that replicates each of these logs. So there's a single leader elected, all the reads and writes go through that leader. And then the leader then will replicate that data to the two followers. Um, and then one of the other key things is we're super easy to get going, play with, manage, and run. There's not a bunch of individual microservices to run. Everything's packaged as a single binary, um, which really helps with, uh, yeah, getting running in production. So that's Red Panda. In 60 seconds, we're going to walk through sort of some of the more, um, oh, well, and also data transfers. 
data transforms of what the scene. So we talked about those two different logs or those partitions. So the main thing about these WebAssembly data transforms, I highlighted this very briefly um, earlier on when we talked about Flink, but you have these individual squares or records within the log. Uh, they get written and write, written by clients. And then basically WebAssembly is something that will pull from one log, do some transformation, and then write different records into a separate log. Uh, sort of as like a background process um, running. So this gives you the ability to really easily sort of like write data in a different format, for example, or you can do things like strip out PII or do data scrubbing for certain other parts of your application. There's a bunch of very, uh, very common use case within these big streaming um, distributed systems is doing these very simple, straightforward uh, tasks. Cool. So we're going to talk a little bit uh, about Red Panda itself, um, sort of, and what makes it so fast, what makes it so efficient, what are sort of the, the, the things that Red Panda does, how does the system sort of work at a high level. So um, one thing is that the, the system's built to be entirely asynchronous. So there's no blocking system calls and we run a thread per core architecture. So this is something that's common in, in a common sort of architecture in high performance computing environments. But basically we run this uh, reactor loop on each individual uh, on a thread that's pinned to a core. So that thread never executes on a different core. There's no context switching or anything like that. It always runs on that core. We can, in sort of NUMA uh, architectures, we can co-locate our memory and our core together to sort of squeeze out all the performance we can from the hardware. Um, we use a shared nothing model. So no memory is shared between each of these threads. On startup, we'll divide the system memory uh, equally between all these threads. And then the threads communicate themselves using single pro single producers, single consumer message queues. Um, and then it's built using this, this, a lot of this functionality comes in this framework called CSTAR, which is a really great framework that we use um, that handles a lot of this uh, basics for us. Um, so I talked a little bit about this reactor loop that runs. So one thing I said, everything's asynchronous. So everything that runs, runs, um, needs to run for a very short time. It uses cooperative multitasking. You don't have these big threads that are running that you context switch between and you rely on the kernel to sort of make sure all these threads are making progress. Is if if a single uh, task within a thread runs for 30 seconds, um, that's known what we call as a reactor stall. And um, because during that 30 seconds that runs or, you know, even 30 milliseconds really for us is um, doing this 30 milliseconds, no other IO can happen. No client request can be served. So all of these stalls impact the P99 latencies um, because there's nothing else that can happen on that core during that time. So what happens as a result of this is any long running computations that run need to be broken up into smaller chunks of a millisecond or two uh, to prevent blocking really important IO work. Um, that is happening. So such as servicing client traffic or reading from disk and things like that. Uh, we use a shared nothing allocator. Um, so again, we talked about we we split up the memory for each of these different um, cores on startup. And then we use a buddy allocator on each shard. And there's no synchronization between different threads. So a lot of the very advanced, uh, if you've studied allocators, a lot of the advanced allocators do all these interesting thread local and uh, try to reduce synchronization. And we sort of do that by design by just saying no, no um, threads share any memory at all. They all get their own own portion of it. And then there's no no page cast. So we use uh, direct DMA controller writes, uh, direct IO to write directly to disks and um, don't have, use the kernel's page cache at all. So it allows us to have full control over the best ways to uh, cache and manage memory ourselves. Um, but it's on us to do that, right? The kernel has a lot of great optimizations that have been put on it by many people, um, but we get full control to sort of eke out those last couple um, bits of, of performance. Um, another interesting note, especially for within the context of WebAssembly, is that generally when you're writing a C program, you can malloc and ask for memory um, from the OS and it will never really directly fail. Um, it'll sort of slop, uh, like soft fail by as you ask for memory in typical situations, it'll just performance will start to degrade as you use that memory um, and page swaps can happen and things like that. And eventually as you use more and more memory, um, the OOM killer can, can run in. But C stars allocator is different in that if you... All that memory that we divide up on startup, that that's it. That's all you got. So if you um, if we have too much fragmentation or exhaust memory, um, we'll throw exceptions, and it's sort of on us to either handle those or abort the process or whatever it should be. Um, 
there's a lot more constraints and each of those generally we run we usually say like at least two gigabytes of ram per core or per th uh, thread that's running so it's generally the sort of um model that you run with so it's not a ton of memory um that you may normally be used to running with um so we're going to talk next about sort of how we address these challenges so there's all these interesting constraints about that make red panda really fast um, but it also becomes a, a, a challenge when you're integrating a VM that may not be specifically designed to meet all of these uh, or designed under these sort of constraints, right? Um, so so one is like, one, one thing that we did um, very early on is we built a software development kit to sort of hide the complexities of some of the techniques that we did to users. So for example, one thing is, like I said, memory usage is very limited and we try not to do large allocations uh, that are contiguous because those can cause lots of fragmentation. Um, so what we do is we do, we, we'll do a lot of things within the VM for users to manage memory well, such as pooling buffers and reusing memory when possible um, and things like that. And we handle that sort of transparently inside the software development kit and give users a sort of idiomatic experience. So this is an example of our, our tiny Go SDK um, the sort of functions, the snippet of code that you would write to transform something, say you get a, a record that comes in as XML and you want to transform that into JSON. Uh, this is sort of a snippet of how you would do that. Um, but the, yeah, the main thing is like all the complexity stuff of our ABI specification, that's all handled and done by the SDK. So the fact that we're, you know, writing into some place in memory and you need to call this very specific function that the runtime expects to be there, that's all handled with an SDK. So users just get this nice single function to write their logic in. Um, one thing for memory, like I said, because like I talked about fragmentation and sometimes as a long running process goes, memory may be fragmented enough that if a VM needs to get 10 megabytes of memory, we may not have a contiguous range of those 10 megabytes of memory. And all the uh, VMs need these sort of large contiguous chunks of memory. Um, so what we do is we pre-allocate all this on startup uh, for each core is we'll basically, you know, each core has two gigabytes and we'll reserve some configurable amount of memory um, that then the VMs get to use themselves and run. Um, and then the other thing that we do that is really neat is um, there's, well, there's, there's two versions of this. One is some functionality that we expose. So uh, one example of that is we have a registry of what schema your data is currently at. Um, and how we implement that within Red Panda is the data for that is sharded across all the cores. So we don't have all these requests going to a single core. Because again, we're doing message passing if you need data. And we're not using up all the memory on one core to service all these schemas. So they're in memory. And what we'll do is we'll, uh, is if a WASM transformation needs to go look up one of these schemas is we'll, um, we run each of these VMs on a separate stack. And what we'll do is we'll, um, using sort of, if you're familiar with uh, stackful coroutines, this is sort of how they work, but we'll pause the VM um, by when it calls into our, our host function to grab that. If we don't have the data locally on our shard, we'll pause the VM, suspend it, and do other sorts of IO work, client facing traffic, whatever needs to happen um, within Red Panda for that core. We'll hop over to another core, request the data, and when it comes back, we'll resume the VM with the data now. And that's all transparent within the VM. There's no async stuff that needs to happen within the VM itself. And sort of if we had to do things like network calls and things like that, other sorts of async work, um, because Red Panda is an async first system, um, we would we would use this sort of technique to do that. But again, this can all be transparent. You don't have to write highly asynchronous code. So if you're writing something like C or uh, Tiny Go, you don't have to, it's a very familiar um, to like a, a coroutine sort of programming model. It's, it's, you don't have to burden yourself with understanding like when things sync and have all manage all these callbacks. Um, so we do this with stack switching. It's, it's really quite, quite fun. Um, so we'll talk about, um, so it's sort of like the challenges with that we face with Red Panda and sort of some of the ways we solve them is like, how are we going to do some of these asynchronous work without blocking a reactor and causing all these stalls and high latencies? Um, so we're going to talk about what other system, other systems that use WASM and what they use them for. Um, so one example is, is this, uh, is the Envoy proxy. So it's a sort of, uh, if, if you're familiar with Nginx or Apache, these sorts of um, different network proxies is Envoy is sort of a cloud native first one and it, and it allows you to upload WebAssembly to do request filters or change requests or route them different ways or do all sorts of uh, custom logic within. You can upload a WASM module to do that. Uh, another example of WASM 
being used is in the open policy agent. So um, this is a, there's a language here called Rego, which allows you to write policies um, of, of, you know, authorization, for example, of what things are allowed to happen. And those can get compiled into WebAssembly modules. So then they can run sort of anywhere within a WebAssembly VM. So you can have custom, these custom policies um, that are ran um, without needing to build an SDK and an interpreter for Rego in every every individual language. Um, cool. All right, and the key takeaways here is, um, yeah, so WebAssembly can be used to simplify data streaming and you don't have to set up another distributed system within Red Panda and it's lightweight and efficient. And then the WASI standard is a great way, if you're not familiar with that, to expose uh, familiar sort of POSIX environments to developers. Um, you want to hide details that users don't want to worry about, um, such as what your ABI um, contract is and how you call into the VM and manage that. Um, and then the WASM ecosystem is constantly evolving, but there's already enough to like really build production ready um, systems in it and integrate this on the server side uh, platforms. Awesome. Uh, thanks for thanks for joining. We have some Q&A now. Uh, there's already a few questions that, I'll, um, that are already posted. I'll read through here and answer. If you have others, feel free to uh, type them into the QA box and happy to answer them. So uh, what language of choice, what is your language of choice to use with, with uh, WebAssembly? So one of the languages um, that we use a lot is, is Go. We think it's got a great um, a tiny Go specifically right now, but we hope to switch to the upstream compiler soon. Uh, tiny Go is, is um, Go in general is a great language because it's it's very simple to use um, and it's it's efficient because it's compiled, but yet you, it doesn't force all of, all of the things that you need to do, uh, such as manage memory and things. And if you're using C plus plus or Rust, so it's like a nice middle ground of like uh, developer developer ergonomics and also performance. Um, that has pretty good support for WebAssembly. So that's that's what we started with our SDKs um, is using using Go. So you can develop these different streaming uh, plugins and, and transformations using Go. Um, so next question, are there any uh, projects using WebAssembly extensively that you might know of? So I, I mentioned two, two there. Um, those are the two that come to mind besides, besides Red Panda. Um, the next question, uh, can you use Lua and JavaScript with Wasm? So yes, you can. Um, but again, like I mentioned very earlier, is you need to... Um, when you're you're using these more interpreted languages, you have to build an interpreter into WebAssembly, and then within WebAssembly VM that's running, there's an interpreter that's running that runs your JavaScript code. Um, there may be ways to take the like your JavaScript in Lua and ahead of time compile it, and then run that directly as Wasm. Um, but I don't know any efforts for for JavaScript specifically, um, and and not for Lua. All right, uh, next question is. Red Panda SDK takes care of the Wasm ABI, presumably means you have to maintain an SDK in each language that you want users to write transform in. in. How toilsome is this and how hard it is to change your ABI? Um, yeah, so this is a great question. So it is fairly toilsome. Uh, right now we're, we're, we just support Go, so it's not that toilsome. We're just trying to uh, hammer out the experience there and we'll support more as time goes on. Um, and yeah, it will sort of be, there'll be a porting way. I think the, the main ways that I've seen uh, to reduce the toil in maintaining these multiple SDKs is to try to mirror them as much as possible um, outside of like language um, barriers is you basically write them all very, um, very much the same so that you can kind of look at your JavaScript and look at your, your Go and they're like the code looks almost exactly the same is one way. Another technique you could use um, because again, Wasm, everything sort of compiles into Wasm. You could potentially write all these in something like C and then integrate them all that way as sort of uh, in Go, you see Go, or, um, well, it ends up just all being WebAssembly at the end of the day. Um, and then changing our ABI is a great question. Um, we sort of initially, or have, from, from the start, have built in a um, protocol to sort of manage versions within our ABI. So one of the functions we export and assume that a guest function is going to tell us is what version of the ABI you are. So we can sort of boot up, run the VM and sort of understand what version they're running at. And then um, we can make sure the right support is there um, for that and, and use different host modules to sort of version our protocol as we evolve it. So we have not yet had to make a change, um, but it's built in such a way that should be Straightforward. We will have to support the old ABIs for maybe forever, but um, at least we have a way to make progress and encourage people to upgrade. 
Um, okay, next question is, Wasm's strict runtime limits only apply to Wasm instructions. Are there any host environment function call uh, have to do their own gas metering? How do you make this work with WASI? Um, it's a great question. So um, host environment calls do have to do their own gas metering. Some WebAssembly VMs uh, support attaching a uh, instruction cost to a given module. Uh, or to a given host function. So after you know it, it, you run X number of instructions, then you call into a, some host uh, code, and then it will automatically decrement. You know uh, the host code count is is like twenty instructions or whatever it is, um, or or whatever your gas per, like cost is, um, which is pretty cool. So that's one way to do it. You can also a lot of VMs end up letting you directly access the sort of a uh, place where metering or the gas is stored. So you can also just in your host function, if you have like a dynamic cost you want to associate, you can increment or decrement the gas as it runs. Um, but again, this is sort of specific to what, what VM you end up using. Um, cool. And then let's see, next question. How does Red Panda store and retrieve WASM code? Do you have, have pre-execution validation or similar checks before modules are loaded into the database? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, we store them internally. We have sort of, um, a mechanism for storing things, uh, metadata that we store. Um, and then we also store the code itself uh, on disk and replicate it so that it's all safe uh, to use and you can access it from any node in the cluster. Um, and then, yeah, pre-execution validation. So every time somebody uploads a uh, WebAssembly module, we compile it and make and run it through a few of these checks, the ABI checks, make sure we can specify the ABI version and um, yeah, th things like that as they're, as they're loaded in. That's a great question. And then last one here is, what is the compilation model you're using for Wasm? So uh, today we are using a JIT compiler um, in Red Panda for a, a variety of reasons. One is the ahead of time compilation would be great for our use case because we sort of expect you to upload something once and we're gonna run that a ton and we want that to be really fast. Um, but there's developer experience to sort of consider here when you're also picking a developer model or a compilation model, because if you're uploading this already ahead of time compiled machine code, you have a, an, a very easy attack vector there of like, you need to make sure you can validate that machine code is only executing within the sandbox constraints and things like that. So um, that's the reason we're using just in time compilation. You can get some of the performance uh, benefits of compiling, you know, uh, to machine code, but you're doing that on the server just in time as you need it. So there's uh, a less like you need to compile this for your right host and architecture and some of all these concerns. You can just deploy some raw WASM from your, uh, you know, your M1 MacBook and then your your Linux x86-64 uh, machine can can just compile that to the to the right right thing. So that's one of our concerns there. Um, cool. What WASM runtime are you using in production? So currently we're able to uh, use a couple different ones. Um, we, we've we experimented with um, V8, WASM time, WASM edge are the main ones. We sort of like took a little bit. Um, V8 for a number of reasons doesn't work super well in the constraints that Red Panda has in terms of memory and thread per core architecture. So we've been working with both WASM time and WASM edge and are, are sort of like working between the two. Um, all right. And then another question here. Great, I, lo I love all these questions. Um, does a data transform, transform explicitly materialize the transform log or does it support fused change transformations? So yeah, that's another great question. So uh, transformations right now are, are written to that separate log. Um, we don't have support for like ephemeral change, ephemerally changing um, data as it's written or um, read at the moment, although this is something we're actively exploring and looking into. Um, but yeah, so currently the model today is you write into one partition within a topic and then that partition gets transformed into an output topic um, and you can also chain these into make sort of like a DAG of transformations so you could take one you could write things into one topic from your producer and WebAssembly could change that to another and then you could have another one that changes that back um, although we don't support cycles because obviously then you'd just be looping data all around through the system cool all right, uh, I think we're, we're running close to time here. Um, those are great questions. Thanks everyone for attending. Uh, feel free to reach out um, here, walk through my all my socials and contact. Feel free to reach out to me and ask, ask some questions um, uh, on, on Twitter or LinkedIn, or you can email me. I'm happy to talk more about Red Panda or Web, WebAssembly at all. 
Um, so again, thank you very much to the Linux Foundation and I'll hand it back over uh, to, to Candice. Thank you so much, Tyler, for your time today. And thank you everyone for joining us. As a reminder, this recording will be on the Linux, Fan Linux Foundation's YouTube page later today. We hope you will join us for future webinars and have a wonderful day.